The winner is The Sound of Things Falling by Juan Gabriel Vasquez, translated from the Spanish by Anne McLean. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm honored and uh, humbled and grateful to be here. Um, I did prepare some notes that I would like to share with you, but as a Colombian politician once said, before speaking, I would like to say a few words. <laughs> um, and they're words of gratitude uh, to the city of Dublin, to uh, libraries in general, but to one library in particular, the Colegio de Mexico. Um, to my editor, Bill Swainson, uh, who gave me a gift six years ago, a book by W.G. Sable, in which he wrote um, that he was giving it to me as a talisman for the journey we were starting out together. This journey has taken us to great places, Bill. The Mansion House is one of them. Um, to my translator, Anne McLean, but I'll get back to that later. To my wife, Mariana, to whom the book is dedicated with the words in Anne McLean's translation, inventor of spaces and time. Don't let me get into that. <laughs> um, to people who are not here, uh, my Spanish publisher, Pilar Reyes, my agent, Maria Lynch. Uh, I've, I've often been asked in, this, in these last um, couple of days, what does the price mean for me? And, uh, my answer usually begins with the words, it's all about the names. It's, it's, it's all about the names of the people who've won it. Um, writers that I respect and admire, uh, such as Colum McCann, Colum Toybin, Orhan Pamuk, and Javier Marias, who particularly has been a, a strong influence on my work. Um, but also the names in the shortlist, in this, in this wonderful shortlist of, of distinguished authors, but I would like to single one of them out, Andres Neumann. Um, he is the author of one of the great novels I've read in, in the last few years, Traveler of the Century, but he's also my friend. So I would like to um, pay a little homage to him and say uh, publicly with witnesses that um, that thing we discussed where we split the prize, that was only good if you won it. Uh. Okay. Serious matters now. Lord Mayor of Dublin, Mr. Christy Burke, Chief Executive of Dublin City Council, Mr. Wayne Keegan, Dublin City Librarian, Ms. Margaret Hayes, dear members of the jury, where are they? Yeah, very dear members of the jury, <laughs> friends. There are mysterious ties between the novels that have shaped our worldview and the cities we love. In 1996, when I arrived in Paris, driven by the single obsession of becoming a novelist, the first thing I did was cross the river from my Chambre de Bonne in the 8th arrondissement and look for number 12, Rue de l'Odéon, the place where in 1922 an expatriate called Sylvia Beach, took it on herself to publish, under her bookstore's name, Shakespeare and Company, an impossible novel by an Irishman who was already a legend of sorts. I had read Joyce's Ulysses for the first time in 1993. No other discovery, except reading 100 Years of Solitude when I was 16, played such a definitive role in my decision to brush everything else aside, including my law degree and my residence in my country, and giving in to the fact that reading and writing fiction were the only things that mattered to me in life. During my three years in Paris, I studied Joyce's books intensely while I spent my free time looking for the places where the writers I loved had lived and worked. The park, for instance, where a passerby told Joyce in Latin that he was a terrible writer. The house where Gustave Flaubert wrote A Sentimental Education. The cafe where two characters from Julio Cortázar's Hopscotch 
met for the first time. So yes, I've always been guilty of what Mario Vargas Llosa calls literary fetishism. In, on April 16, 2009, when I landed for the first time in Dublin, this international city of words, I felt a shock of recognition. I knew the place well. I could find my way in it, and I knew it was because I had walked around it with Bloom and Stephen Dedals. After one of my first interviews here, Cormac Kinsella, I asked Cormac Kinsella, or perhaps it was his idea, um, instigated by my fetishism, to take me to the Davy Burns, where Bloom sits down to eat. Later in the day, I asked him to take me to the house where the dead is set. And um, Cormac complied with the tolerance one shows towards the games of children, maybe because he knew well that children take them very, very seriously. For uh, admittedly, there is something childish in that cult of places whose importance comes from what never happened in them. But serious readers of fiction, people like me for whom novels and short stories have taken over the years the place of religion, people like me for whom works of fiction are not just somewhere to live in, but also lessons in life. We know this. We know the great virtue of things that never happened is that they will go on happening forever. Forever, my namesake, Gabriel Conroy, will look out that window and see the snow falling on the living and the dead. Forever, Stephen will walk on the strand thinking about Berkeley, Samuel Johnson, Aristotle, and Dante in the same paragraph. And forever will that walk happen at 11 a.m. That is exactly 110 years minus four days ago. These events are part of my memory. And dare I say it, part of my biography, too. They are part of my experience as much as the things that actually happened to me. And I remember them. I remember them distinctly. I remember the massacre of the banana plantation workers in 100 Years of Solitude. And I remember Jose Arcadio Buendia had a boy on his shoulders when the soldiers began shooting. I remember distinctly how Anna Karenina wanted to throw herself under the wheels of the first carriage. But the little red handbag um, she, has, she had was, got entangled in her sleeve, and she had to wait for the next carriage. I remember distinctly how Juan Dalman in Borges' The South is about to walk out of a barroom brawl when an old man dressed like a gaucho throws him a knife and forces him to fight. You may have heard of Korsakov's syndrome. People afflicted by it tend to replace real memories with fictitious ones, or make up memories to fill up the gaps left by memories that have disappeared. Now, I've always felt this is, in a manner of speaking, a metaphor of um, how fiction works. And that is why serious readers of fiction are formed morally, emotionally, too, by those things that never happened. It is in this spirit that I wrote the novel you have so generously distinguished today. I wrote it to remember in fiction what I had forgotten in real life. I wrote it with the arrogant feeling that it would allow other Colombians to remember the same forgotten feelings, the feeling of fear, the feeling of unpredictable violence, the feeling of a country falling apart, really falling apart during those difficult decades. I wrote this novel, as all the writers I admire have written the books I love, out of dissatisfaction, because we had heard too much over the years about the political and social consequences of the drug wars, about its external and all too visible manifestations. But there was no place, at least that I knew of, where I could go to find out about the internal manifestations the moral and emotional, again, consequences of having lived through those years 
which left no one unscathed. I wrote this novel as the old Dr. Rowe once said to me to redistribute pain. Recently, Danish novelist Jens Christen Gröndal called my attention to a wonderful quote by Logan Pearsall Smith. The great art of writing is to make people real to themselves with words, giving them, through language and imagination, a deeper sense of how they are built, helping them understand the myriad ways in which we are determined by the world outside us. I wrote this novel to try to fulfill this mandate. Now, having said this, I would like you to uh, remember an important fact, that the words you have read and appreciated are not mine. They were chosen by Anne McLean. In awarding this prize to a novel in translation, you are also recognizing the role translators play, not only in our civilization, but in our private lives. I don't know, for instance, how I could live in my country right now without two words imported from the Greek, politician and idiot. <laughs> translation is what allows me to say that my understanding of what we are as human beings has been shaped by Tolstoy, by Chekhov or by Kafka, even though I don't speak a word of Russian or German. Anne McLean had to deal with a writer obsessed with sound, with rhythm and with detail, and she survived for the third time. I would like to thank her for her words. I would like to thank her for her words and remember that she's a Canadian who was living in England when she met me, a Colombian living in Spain. And now we are being presented this award in Dublin. So when I call Dublin an international city of words, I wasn't joking. To dedicate your day and night to invest all your intellectual and emotional energies in these characters that never existed in the accurate and true depiction of what they think and feel and experience. It's also to believe in the idea that our thirst for knowledge does not end with what really happened, nor is it quenched with mere information. What could have happened? The borderless realm of human possibility, the dark corners of our human condition that we cannot and could never reach through other means. That is the stuff fictions are made of. And to my mind, there is no better vehicle to explore these dark areas than this strange invention we call the novel, so young still at 450 years of age. Thank you for the bottom of my heart, for sharing the idea that this is important, for recognizing its pertinence and for supporting with such commitment those of us who think that it is something worth dedicating your life to. Thank you very much.